Let's make a transition now from the balance sheet to the income statement. We spent some time talking about that balance sheet that records the financial position of an entity as of a point in time. Now we need to talk about the income statement, which really measures the operations of a company over a period of time. You may recall the operating cycle starts when we purchase goods and services, materials, raw materials, ingredients, that type of thing. We pay our suppliers, we pay our employees, we pay our other operating expenses. Then we sell whatever it is we're in business to sell, and ultimately our customers will collect cash from us. That's the operating cycle. What we're trying to measure with the income statement is the results, okay, the scorecard from what happened during a period of time from the operations that we conducted. In order to do this, we have to artificially take the business and divide it into chunks of time, whether that be days, weeks, months, quarters, or years. Now, days and weeks, eh, you, could, you could prepare an income statement for a day or for a week, but it starts to become a lot of work if you had to do that every day. So a lot of companies prepare monthly income statements and then annual income statements. Some may also produce some quarterly reports. What we're seeing here though is we need to take the activities of the entity and we need to artificially divide them into some kind of time period and then identify which period of time we are actually measuring. Important for us to talk about cash basis for versus accrual basis. In this class, assume that we're using the accrual basis unless you're told otherwise. And that's because United States GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, and IFRS as well, International Financial Reporting Standards, they require accrual basis. Accrual basis is certainly more work for the accountant, uh, but it provides a more robust picture of the future cash flows and the results of the operations for an entity. You see, with cash basis, transactions only affect the income statement when we receive cash or when we pay cash. So if we didn't receive the money from our customers, we would not include that as revenues on our income statement. And if we didn't actually write a check or send money versus, you know, via Venmo or PayPal or some electronic transaction, if we didn't pay for it, it's not going to show up on the income statement under cash basis. Cash basis is simple in that regard. My very first business was cash basis. I firmly remember this. City of Grand Rapids was uh, redoing the street on which I lived when I was growing up. And the neighbor girl and I uh, developed, we, we made a Kool-Aid stand. We sold Kool-Aid to the construction workers. Very first cash basis business. It was a partnership. We didn't even know there was a partnership. We didn't have a partnership agreement. Don't tell the IRS, we never even filed a partnership income tax return. These are the things you don't know about when you're eight years old. But that was my first business, cash basis. Also the most profitable too, at least from a percentage standpoint, because it was all revenue, no cost of goods sold. The sugar, the Kool-Aid mix, and the water all came from my parents' kitchen. If I could duplicate that business, I'd do it every day as an adult. But <clears throat> most companies need to use the accrual basis because the accrual basis allows us to measure the economic impact of transactions on a particular time period, even if we haven't received cash or paid cash. So revenues will show up on the income statement in the period in which we earn the revenue, even if we get paid later, or maybe even if we got paid earlier. Uh, and the expenses, those are gonna show up on the income statement when we incur the expense, okay? When it becomes something that we owe uh, and ideally, we want to match expenses in the same income statement period as the revenues that were generated by those expenses. So we're going to see instances where expenses show up on the income statement, even though the cash might be paid at a later time, or the cash may have already been prepaid in a previous month or something like that. Assume accrual basis unless you're told otherwise in this class. Let's talk about an accrual basis revenue example. Now, we earn the revenue when we earn the revenue. It's a revenue recognition principle. Um, so the time period in which we earn the revenue is either the period where we deliver a product to our customer 
or we provided the service to the customer and we have the right to get paid for it even if we haven't gotten paid yet and collection is reasonably certain so in other words we're pretty sure that we're going to get paid uh, even if we haven't gotten paid yet so what's happening here let's say that we have a lawn care business and we're going to mow somebody's lawn i'm going to keep it a real simple example and let's start with a period where cash is received in the same month when revenue is earned. So let's say that we're going to earn $100 for mowing somebody's lawn. That would be a debit. Remember, assets increase with a debit. And we're going to earn the sales revenue here of $100. And that's going to be a credit to sales revenue. As a reminder, this asset cash is an asset on the balance sheet. Sales revenue is a revenue account that will be reported on the income statement. So in this particular month, we earned $100, which we record sales revenue for that amount. And we happen to get paid for that same amount. Now, what if we had a situation like this? We're going to mow the lawn, but we require prepayment. Okay, So we're going to get paid in the month before we actually perform the service. Here's what would happen month before we perform the service, we're going to get the cash. We record cash of $100. Cash goes up. Now, you guys know at this stage of the game, if you're going to debit some account, you need to credit another account. You might be tempted to credit sales revenue. After all, we received the cash. However, remember, this cash is coming into our checkbook the month before we provide the services. So instead of crediting sales revenue, we're going to credit a current liability account called deferred revenue. I'd like to point this out. The cash, as will always be the case, is still on the balance sheet. The deferred revenue is on the balance sheet. Look at what the balance sheet is doing. The balance sheet is preventing this $100 from appearing on the income statement because it's not yet time for that to appear on the income statement. Nothing has been done by us to earn that revenue. So instead of crediting revenue on the income statement like this, we credit deferred revenue, which is a liability on the balance sheet. Then what's going to happen in that subsequent month is we would record a journal entry that looks kind of like this. So the next month, we would... Uh, take the, well, let's put our debits and credits here. Okay. That deferred revenue, I'm going to abbreviate it DR for deferred revenue. Don't confuse that with the debit record. We'll get rid of the liability and then we can record the sales revenue. Okay. Of $100. So look what would happen after two months has, has transpired. At the end of the first month, we had this liability on our balance sheet. The balance sheet will say deferred revenue is equal to $100. Then what will happen is next month when we actually earn the revenue by mowing the person's lawn, we will get rid of the deferred revenue. Remember, a liability decreases when you make a debit entry to that account. And we would transfer that into sales revenue on the income statement. Up here, nothing touched the income statement. Down here, Liability goes away, sales revenue goes away. Notice we did not affect cash over here because we did not get paid again. We got paid the month before. Customer is not going to pay us twice for the same job. Now, the last situation that can happen is that we get paid after the revenue is earned. So what's going to happen with this is, in this case, um, let's, let's do it in the green color here. We're earning the revenue in the month where we perform the service. So we mow somebody's lawn, we're done with the job, they owe us money, they have not yet paid us, but we earned the revenue. So this should go on the income statement because it reflects the results of what we did in our operations that month. We mowed the lawn, let's put the dollars on the scorecard. But unlike what we did down here, contrast these two. Here we recorded the revenue because we earned it, and we happen to debit cash because we got paid. Here we record the revenue because we earned it, 
but we cannot debit cash. We did not get paid yet. What's going to happen is we debit this current asset called accounts receivable because we will get paid, but maybe next month. For example, next month when we do get paid, we'd have a journal entry that looks like this. Cash increases because finally the customer pays us. And I'm going to abbreviate accounts receivable as AR. This accounts receivable goes away. So building on this situation over here, we record the revenue when we earned it. We did not get cash, so we make this current asset called accounts receivable increase with a debit. Now on our balance sheet at the end of that month, we have this asset. Think about the future cash flows. When we report $100 of accounts receivable in the balance sheet, that tells the financial statement reader that we expect to receive $100 from our customers within the next 12 months. And in fact, that better be a lot sooner than 12 months because if our customers take 12 months to pay us, we need better customers. Then the next month comes, al comes along, customer pays us, so we let the cash account increase. That account receivable goes away. Now accounts receivable is zero. Of course, in a real business, this would, you know, we would have other customers, so the accounts receivable balance is very fluid, but I think you get the concept. Regardless of when the cash was actually given to us, we record the revenue in the period where it was earned. Not unlike what we did for revenues, we can accomplish the same kind of thought process with expenses. We should record the expense on the income statement in the period where we incurred the expense. Ideally, we're also trying to match those expenses with the revenues that were generated by those expenses. So if we take a look at this situation here, we might have a situation where we pay cash in the exact month where the expense was incurred. And you might notice that I have like question mark expense here. Well, what I'm really trying to point out is there are lots of expenses that a company could incur. Depreciation expense, supplies expense, uh, legal expense, cost of goods sold is an expense. So just think about this as being any type of expense that you could incur. So let's say that, um, well, we used lawn care. We can look, look at snow plowing. It's winter in Michigan and we have to pay to get our, our parking lot plowed. So it's the month of January. We write a check. We'll just use $100 again. We write a check to the company that plows our parking lot. Cash goes down. It's an asset decreasing with a credit. And since the parking lot was plowed, in that month of January, we put that expense on the January income statement. And I'm just going to write January there just to kind of, kind of highlight that. So in the month of January, that expense goes on the income statement because we incurred the expense. They plowed our parking lot during the month of January. It's appropriate for that expense to reduce net income for January. And we happen to pay cash for it in that particular month. Now it's possible, let's look over here for a second. It's possible to say, well, maybe the plow service sends us a bill and we don't pay it till February. So we still want this to be on the income statement for January, even if we don't pay the cash in January. So take a look here, just like we did before, we're recording the expense on the January income statement because that's the income statement where it belongs. But we didn't spend money. We don't have a cash account to credit in this case. What we're gonna do is we're gonna either put it, now I put accrued expense. Most likely this is gonna be an account called accounts payable. I'll just abbreviate it AP. But it could be an accrued expense, uh, accrued snow plowing service, accrued whatever, maybe just accrued expenses. But the point is this, this asset, or this liability, excuse me, that is not an asset, it's a liability. This is a liability on the balance sheet. So we didn't touch the cash account. What's going to happen is eventually, let's say maybe oh, in February, we pay the bill. This is what will happen. When we pay that bill, we're going to debit the accounts payable account for 100 bucks. And then the cash account, I've got to make sure I have enough room here. 
we'll credit that for 100. So what we're seeing here is this is an expense that's being accrued into the month of January, even though the cash might be paid at a later date, like February. We're getting the expense in the proper income statement, even though we did not pay cash. The balance sheet facilitates our ability to get this expense on the income statement. Now, of course, the plowing company could require us to prepay. They could say, sure, we will plow, we'll plow your parking lot, but you got to pay in advance. All right, fair enough. So here's December of the previous year. We write them a check for $100. Cash is going down. Not appropriate yet to debit an expense on the income statement because this is not a December expense. This relates to plowing that's going to happen in January. So we have this right here, which is a current asset, and it's going to be reported on the balance sheet at the end of December. $100. Remember, current assets are either cash, they're expected to become cash, or they're expected to be used up within the next 12 months. Well, this current asset called prepaid expenses, prepaid snowplow expense, or whatever you want to call it, it's not going to be converted to cash. We're probably not going to get our money back in the form of a refund from the snowplow company, but this is expected to be used up within the next 12 months. It's expected to be consumed. And in fact, it will be consumed. Let me just prove it to you down here. Because when we get to January, in this situation, what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to change markers. That's a very squeaky marker. So we're down here in January. And now the company plowed our lot. Here's what we do. We're going to record the expense in the month of January with a debit right here. And we're going to credit, and I'm going to abbreviate this PPD, prepaid. We're going to credit the prepaid current asset. Notice that under all these scenarios, expense is being recorded in the month of January, regardless of when the cash actually got paid to our vendor. Um, and the balance sheet allows us to get that expense onto the appropriate income statement, whether we paid the cash in advance or pay the cash after the month. Let's record some of the income statement transactions for Blake's Coffee House. I want to point this out. What we did with the balance sheet discussion for this example company uh, January was its initial month of opening for business. I mean, it wasn't even open for customers. We were just, we formed the business, we bought the equipment, we got everything ready, but we didn't touch anything that involved the income statement in the month of January. Now what we're doing is we're taking a look at the month of February where we can actually start some of our operations. So what you'll notice on some of these uh, T accounts, I have balances preloaded, beginning balances. That's because if you go back and look at those videos that we have for the balance sheet uh, transactions, you'll see that we ended with a cash balance of $20,700. Well, guess what? If you end the month of January with $20,700, you're going to start the month of February with $20,700 in your bank accounts. So that's why we have those starting balances. Now, over here we have revenue accounts. Here's beverage sales and I'm just going to write this on here even though it might be obvious to you. This is going to be a revenue account reported on the income statement. This is also a revenue account reported on the income statement. Why do we have two separate revenue accounts? There's no rule that says we have to. We have those accounts because that's what we think will be meaningful to people who are reading our financial statements. We think it might be important for them to be able to distinguish how much of our sales revenue is derived from selling beverages versus selling food to customers. And guess what? Some companies might have more revenue accounts. What if we had a catering division that would bring you know, coffee and pastries and things like that to local offices? We might have a catering sales account. We might have a delivery revenue account if we charge for delivery. These revenue accounts can be whatever are meaningful for you and for the users of your company's financial statements. So let's begin operations here. And we're going to keep this pretty simple, okay? Um, 
it, it is a, an overly simplified example, but I do that on purpose uh, because it, uh, it'll keep us from muddying the waters with a lot of complication. I realize that a real life coffee house would have a lot more complication than what we're going to see in these upcoming transactions, but just appreciate the simplicity here. All right, so let's assume that we, for the month of February, and we're just going to record our sales revenue once a month. We're not going to make a journal entry every time a customer shows up and buys a latte. But for the month of February, we, record, we aggregated all of our sales, and we know that in total, customers paid cash to us. So here's the start of a journal entry. Debits and credits. Remember, and I'll even do this for you um, at this stage of the game. Remember our little cheat sheet that we have. Assets, liabilities, owners, owners equity, revenues, expenses. And the debit and credit rules. Okay. Assets go up with a debit, down with a credit. Expenses behave the same way. And all the other three, liabilities, owners, equity, and revenues, they behave exactly the opposite. So if in total, our cash increased by $3,000 because customers spent money with us, we need to make a debit entry to our cash account. Now let's say that the, uh, the revenue here, so I'm gonna call this uh, beverage revenue, I'm gonna put it on two lines just for space there, indenting with a credit for, uh, for, for the, uh, it's kind of indicating that we're gonna be crediting this account. And then we have uh, food revenue as well. Okay. And you might be asking, where did we get these numbers from? Oh, probably like a point of sale system that we would have, cash register system, computer system, whatever that would be. That's where we're getting this information. But what you're seeing is this is the journal entry required to record our sales for the month that involve cash. So cash goes up by 3,000. Beverage revenue increases by 2,000. Revenue goes up with a credit. Food revenue increases by 1,000. This would be the general journal entry that we would record to record this transaction. Now what we have to do is we have to post this entry to the T accounts. We know that our debits equal our credits. Debits are 3,000. This adds up to 3,000 over here. So we can take this and basically break it apart and we'll post this 3,000 to the cash account. And you'll take this revenue right here and we're gonna dump that up here as a credit entry to the beverage sales revenue account. I see that I put revenue here and sales here, almost synonymous, um, sales, sales revenue. Um, you can assume that those are basically the same thing. And then we put the $1,000 here. What you'll notice is suddenly our cash account becomes 23,700 right there. The beverage sales account no longer has a zero balance. We're going to have a $2,000 credit balance, and that's normal for a revenue account. That means it's a positive revenue. If we had a debit balance in a revenue account, that would actually reduce the account. It would be a negative revenue. We don't want that, okay? And the food sales revenue, that nets out to $1,000 on the credit side of things. We've recorded our first income statement transaction. Let's see if we can do another one. Take a look at our cash account. The $20,700 was a beginning balance. That was end of January, beginning of February. And then just a moment ago, we collected some cash from our customers for selling food and beverage. We're gonna record some other cash collections from our customers. Uh, let's receive $300 from them, but it's not for food and beverage. It's for future food and beverage. Every one of you watching this video has received a gift card, okay? So let's say that uh, you buy your favorite accounting professor a $300 gift card. I know that's a realistic scenario. And so you go to the coffee house, you give them $300. The coffee house now has your money. The coffee house's cash account is going to increase. But ask yourself this question. Did the coffee house earn that money? Did they earn the revenue? They have it, they own it, but does it belong on the income statement? And the answer is no. They've done nothing to earn that. 
So what they really have is this liability. I'm going to abbreviate it DR. Again, it's not debit record. Okay, I'm just abbreviating deferred revenue here. <clears throat> and you might also notice, just for simplicity, I stopped putting the debit record, credit record, record up here. We can just assume in the journal entry, if we put something in the left-hand side, it's a debit. If you put it on the right-hand side, it's a credit. Okay? Starts to make our life a little bit easier, a little bit more efficient, too. So this is the journal entry to record the transaction when the coffee house receives the money and issues a gift card. Let's post it to the account. Okay? So cash is going to increase by $300. And deferred revenue is going to increase by $300. We know that cash is an asset on the balance sheet. Deferred revenue, even though it has the word revenue, we're really tempted to say, oh, that's an income statement account. But it's not. Deferred revenue is a liability that's reported on the balance sheet. Remember when we talked a little bit about accrual accounting, how the balance sheet can be a mechanism to take the economic effects of a transaction and keep them from affecting the income statement until the time is right. Well, at this point, what the truth is, the truth is the coffee house has the cash and it owes $300 worth of food and beverage or other product to whoever redeems that gift card. And when they redeem the gift card, we can get rid of some of this deferred revenue, take it off the balance sheet, put it under the income statement, but that's gonna be a future transaction. More sales with our customers, but this time, we're giving some of our customers a chance to pay later. I know that might be a little bit unrealistic in the scenario of a coffee house, but let's say that we have some corporate accounts where we bring food and beverage to their office for meetings and events. Well, pretty good chance that they're going to want to pay from their accounts payable department with a check or other form of payment at a later date because their own internal controls, they need to make sure that it's legitimate to pay us and they're going to want to have the checks and balances that we're going to talk about in future chapters. When we talk about current liabilities, uh, we're going to talk about some of the checks and balances that companies need to have in place to make sure that a payment to a vendor is valid before we actually make the payment. If we're selling some food and beverage to a corporate entity instead of you know, an individual person off the street, that corporate entity is probably going to want to make sure that this is a legitimate expense before they issue payment. So we may sell on credit to them. And let's look at what this means. Let's say that we sold um, $9,000 worth of food and beverage. So I'm going to make a debit entry to an account called Accounts Receivable. That's this AR. $9,000 during the month. And some of it was for beverage sales. I'm putting $3,000 for beverage sales. And some of it was food sales. As a reminder, these revenue amounts are probably coming out of some data in our point of sale system. Whatever computer system we're using to track this uh, information, hopefully it's computer. Hopefully it's not something like paper and pencil, but I suppose it could be. This journal entry balances, the debits total to 9,000. The credits right here total to 9,000. So we know that our debits equal our credits. Now let's post this to the accounts. The accounts receivable of 9,000 is going to be a debit to accounts receivable. Let's talk about what accounts receivable means for a minute. And the ending balance there, maybe I don't update that every time, but in this case we will. That ending balance, that $9,000, that means that at this point in time, we have a customer or customers that owe us $9,000. Accounts receivable is a current asset reported on the balance sheet. Current asset means that we expect to collect that money within the next 12 months, hopefully sooner, because uh, 12 months would be a really long time to wait to collect money from your customers. The beverage sales and the food sales, just like before, these uh, are revenue accounts on the income statement. And as I mentioned before, we're separating the revenue into food and beverage just because we think that's what's useful for our company. 
Different industries, different companies, they may have different categories of revenue on the income statement. We'll take the 3,000, goes to beverage sales, put it up here. That $2,000 you see right there, that was from the cash transactions from before. So what you're seeing here in the slides is I'm carrying forward some of the cumulative transactions, okay? And that's gonna make this beverage sale account increase from $2,000 credit balance to a $5,000 credit balance. And over here, the food sales, we already had $1,000 in that bucket. Now we're gonna make a credit entry to the food sales revenue account. It's gonna take that $1,000 balance and bring it all the way up to $7,000. That's selling food and beverage on credit. Very common in business to business transactions where you earn the revenue because you sold the product to the customer. It belongs on the income statement as revenue. However, you cannot debit cash yet because you didn't receive cash yet. So let's see what happens when we get some of that cash. That $9,000 that was sitting in accounts receivable, oh, I know it was on this side of the screen a few minutes ago. Um, but um, we had a $9,000 balance, and as a reminder, this asset, this current asset, means that customers or a customer owes us $9,000. Let's say that they pay most, but not all of that, that amount. Let's say they pay us $8,500. Here's what the journal entry is going to look like. Is accounts receivable is going to be a credit because we have an asset decreasing. Once the customer pays us, we don't have that receivable anymore, at least not that amount. So to record this cash receipt from the customer, we're going to make a debit entry to our cash account in the amount of $8,500. Cash is increasing with a debit. Accounts receivable is going to go down to the tune of $8,500. Let's post these to the accounts. Okay, so we, before this receipt, we had $24,000 in the account. Now we're going to have an extra $8,500. That'll bring our cash account up to $32,500. And the accounts receivable portion of it is going to go over here. Now, what you're basically seeing is this. And let me finish the transaction and we'll talk about it. Because we made a credit entry to that asset account. This asset account used to have a $9,000 balance. Now it has a $500 balance. Why? Because it was a $9,000 debit. When we make a credit entry of $8,500 and net the debits with the credits, this leaves us with a net debit balance of $500, which makes perfect sense because the customers used to owe us $9,000. We collected $8,500 of that during the month. At the end of the month, now we have a $500 receivable remaining. And the thing I wanted to point out was this. Both of these are assets. This is an asset in the balance sheet. This is an asset in the balance sheet. Sure, cash is a more liquid asset than accounts receivable because cash is already cash. Accounts receivable only becomes cash once the customer pays us, but they're both assets. And you can see, this illustrates beautifully. A debit entry makes this cash, this asset account go up. A credit entry makes this asset account go down. I don't know about you, but when I'm an employee, I like to get paid eventually. Our employees want to get paid. So let's pay them. Now I'm gonna stop making the journal entry at the bottom. It doesn't mean that journal entries are optional. You have to have some mechanism for recording the transactions. But in the interest of efficiency and to focus on the substance of the transactions, I'm going to start just putting the credits and the debits in the individual T accounts. So think about what happens when we pay our employees. In this instance, cash is actually going to decrease because um, we're paying our employees. So this cash balance is going to, it's going to be accredited by 7800 and that's going to drop the balance down to 24700 because this reduces cash. Now, salaries and wages, remember, expenses are normally debit balances, like assets, okay? Assets are also normally debit balances. So this salaries and wages account right here, even though I don't have the word expense, see, sometimes it's just assumed, um, and, and sometimes it does say expense, Salaries and wages would be an expense 
on your income statement. It's a cost of doing business. As you record expenses, as you incur them, your net income is going to become smaller because look, this expense account used to be zero. Now it's $7,800. Another thing I'd like to point out, remember this is an asset on the balance sheet. Remember when we make our little chart with assets, liabilities, owners, equity, revenues, and expenses. We say assets and expenses behave the same. Everything else is the opposite. You're seeing it in action right here. Credit cash to make it go down. Debit salaries and wages expense to make it go up. They do have the same characteristics as far as debits and credits of bookkeeping. We were making this asset go up with a debit. We make this expense go up with a debit. This asset is going down with a credit, and maybe in a future lesson, we'll talk about some instances where an expense could go down with a credit. For now, just debit those expenses. So let's say that our landlord, as an incentive to get us to lease uh, their property, they said, you know what? January and February, we understand you're a brand new business. Cash flow is probably going to be tight for an infant business. We'll let you have January, February rent free. So we have nothing happening with prepaid rent or rent expense, and, uh, but we do have some obligations starting to come down the road because for March, April, May, and beyond, the landlord is expecting payment. <clears throat> We've been more successful than we had planned. We've got plenty of money in the bank. At least we think that's the case. So let's prepay our rent. Now, let's assume that our rent is $2,400 per month. And if you're like me, I don't really like the hassle of writing checks or even paying transactions. So sometimes when I've been a tenant, like at my airplane hangar, I usually write one check every six months just because I don't want the hassle. Um, let's pretend that as a business, we pay March, April, and May rent in advance. So we're going to pay a total of 7200 bucks. What does that mean? That means our cash account is going to decrease because we're paying money. Asset called cash goes down with a credit and there's a new asset that's going to go up on our balance sheet. $7,200 of prepaid rent. Cash is an asset on the balance sheet. Prepaid rent is also an asset uh, on the balance sheet. And let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, third time's a charm. This is an asset in the balance sheet. Prepaid rent, what this really represents is um, we paid for this transaction in February, but remember, we did not have necessarily a rent expense for February. Oh yeah, I suppose you could make an argument that maybe we should kind of spread things out even though we got a discount, but that's maybe a more advanced topic. Let's assume that we really don't have rent expense for the month of January or the month of February even though we paid the rent in that particular month. This $7,200 is not an expense of the current month. Some of it will be an expense for March, some of it will be an expense for April, some of it will be an expense for May. So instead of crediting cash here and debiting an expense, we credit cash and we dump that amount into another current asset called prepaid rent. Oh yeah, and by the way, after this transaction is complete, the prepaid rent will have a $7,200 balance and the cash balance, because remember, this is bringing cash down. So what we have to do is we have to say, well, the balance used to be $24,700, but we made a credit entry to that account of $7,200. That means our new cash balance is $17,500. I know I didn't do that little balancing calculation for every one of these, but I thought it was it was time for a little bit of review. So what you're doing is you're taking the previous balance, subtract the credit, there's your new debit balance, which is right, right there. Okay, time for another transaction. If you want to entice customers to come to your store, you're gonna to need to advertise at some point. So let's say that we, uh, we run an advertisement with the local newspaper. Maybe that's actually not the best example anymore. How about we spend $500 to boost an advertising post on Facebook? That's probably a more realistic example. Um, or maybe a television ad or a radio ad or a billboard. You get the point. What's going to happen here? Advertising, this is an expense reported on the income statement. 
accounts payable is a liability. More specifically, it's a current liability. Our vendors want to get paid within the next 12 months, so it's a current liability. On the balance sheet, what we're seeing here, this is an accrued expense. The expense belongs on the income statement for February because the advertising impressions were delivered to our potential customers during fe February. We owe the money to the vendor, whether that's Facebook or Snapchat or local radio station or whatever. And our accounts payable balance used to be $10,200. That was all the way back from our balance sheet transactions. Now it becomes $10,700. We have a liability increasing with a credit entry. We have an expense increasing with a debit entry. Nothing affected the, cash, the, the checkbook yet. That's why we didn't touch the cash account yet. Later, when we pay that vendor some money, we will debit the accounts payable account, and then we would credit cash when we actually make the payment to the vendor. We have to pay our electricity bill. Let's assume that we pay the electricity bill in the same period in which we actually use the electricity. That may or may not be true in real life, but we're going to let it happen here in the academic fairy tale world. So utilities expense for this particular month, February, is $600. Utilities is an expense account on the income statement. And just like with those revenue accounts, each business, each industry is going to have expense accounts that are meaningful and appropriate for their particular business. Now, that being said, most companies do have some sort of utilities. Electricity, natural gas, maybe a water bill, um, cable, internet service, that type of thing. Expense increases with a debit. In this case, we actually did remit payment to the electric utility. So we have an asset cash. I guess I'll put it up there. Current, current asset on the balance sheet. And that's a decrease of 600. And last time I checked, if you used to have 17,500, but you spend 600, that means your new cash balance is 16,900. Positive balance because it's a debit, but this credit amount made it just a little bit smaller. After all those transactions have been recorded, what we have are T accounts with the ending balances at the end of February. That's going to be compiled into a trial balance, not unlike what you saw at the end of the balance sheet discussion. We have our assets here. We have our liabilities and owner's equity. We have filled in some revenues now and some expenses, but these are the balance sheet and income statement accounts at that particular point in time. And what you'll notice, remember we just ended, right after we paid that utility bill, there was, we said there's 16,900 in cash. That debit balance gets transferred right on over here. Remember the prepaid rent of 7,200? There it is. Here it is over there. So like we did with the balance sheet, all we're doing is we're taking each of these individual accounts. And I've got the asset ones listed here first. And we're taking those account balances and simply transferring them over to the trial balance. Same is true for these liability accounts. I'll pick on deferred revenue because we, we actually saw accounts payable during the balance sheet discussion. Remember those gift cards that we issued? $300 worth of gift cards. We did not earn the revenue, so it did not go on the income statement as revenue. Instead, it stays in the balance sheet in this liability called deferred revenue. And that $300 credit balance shows up right over here alongside the accounts payable and the note payable that we have. Let's take a look at the owner's equity, the revenues and expenses next. Common stock still has the same $10,000 credit balance that it had after our January transactions. That's because we did not issue any more stock and we didn't have any shareholders redeem their stock. So common stock is what it is. And that's actually very normal. The equity account, common stock, or preferred stock, those contributed capital accounts, um, for some businesses, they may be static balances because there are no changes in ownership of the company. For a publicly traded company, that wouldn't be the case. For a privately held, more likely to be the case. Remember the revenue accounts, the beverage sales? Whether it was in the form of cash or credit, we earned $5,000 for beverage, $7,000 for food, and you can see right here the credit balance is five and seven thousand dollars. Moving over to the expenses, we uh, kind of simplified things. We have salaries and wages, advertising, utilities, 
And you can see that certainly we'll pick on, uh, oh, utilities was the last one we looked at from a transaction standpoint. There's our $600 debit balance. And over here we have the 600 bucks showing up in our trial balance. Debits equal credit in the trial balance. If you take a calculator and add these up, I guarantee you that it will match the total of this column. I know because I checked it just before I did this video. In a previous discussion, we saw how the trial balance could be used to prepare a balance sheet. Now let's look at the, uh, let's look at the income statement. Pretty much what you have with your trial balance is this portion right here is your income statement accounts. And by the way, this up here is your balance sheet accounts. We're going to focus on the income statement because we've got some revenues over here, the $5,000 and the $7,000. What you'll see is that totals up to $12,000. And salaries and wages, advertising utilities, those are our expenses down here. Those actually total up to $8,900. And just a little preview of coming attractions here. Net income, as you might recall from previous discussions, is simply going to be revenues, in this case $12,000, minus expenses, $8,900. And in this case, that equals a net income of $3,100. And that $3,100 right here, you can see that it matches the bottom line in the income statement I prepared. Let's just take a look at this income statement. First of all, this is a highly simplified example. Um, normally what we would see is something called a multiple step income statement. More on that in a future chapter. This is a single step income statement, basically meaning that we group all of our revenues together here, all of our expenses together here. The total of revenues is right there. It's the 12,000 we calculated before. Total of expenses is $8,900 right here. And you can see that your net income, the profit for this period, is that $8,900 subtracted from the $12,000, $3,100. So even though you and I know at this point, not all of this revenue was actually collected in the form of cash. Some of it still sits in accounts receivable, $500 to be exact. You can see it right there. And not all of these expenses were paid in this month. Remember the advertising expense? The vendor extended credit to us. We're going to pay for that maybe let's say in March or something like that. So even though we didn't necessarily receive all of this in cash and we did not necessarily pay all of this in cash during the month of February, we're recording those revenues because they were earned during February. We're recording these expenses because they were incurred during February. And moreover, the matching principle would say, hopefully what we're doing is we're matching these expenses in the time period, February, where we earned the revenues from incurring those expenses. Matching revenues and expenses so we get this complete and meaningful picture of what our profit, our net income was for the period. For the month ended February 28, for those 28 days, assuming it's not a leap year, our profit for that month was $3,100. Okay, we're almost done with this particular video, so I figured I should try to confuse you with some debit and credit rules. Of course, you know that's not the case. I'm trying to simplify. I have a teaching philosophy statement, if you didn't know it. It's basically that I try to take complicated things and make them simpler. So hopefully that's what I'm doing for you here. I'm, trying, I'm not trying to make it more complicated. I'm trying to make it more simple. Remember this basic accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. Now, I want to expand it just a little bit here. Owner's equity, as you know, we've had discussions, is common stock and retained earnings. Contributed capital, in other words, capital that the owners contributed in exchange for their ownership interest. But then this odd concept called retained earnings, which is essentially the profits of the business that are retained within the business. In other words, not distributed back out to the owners. And of course, retained earnings, now, as we incur expenses, that's going to make retained earnings go down. If expenses go up, retained earnings goes down. Okay? So um, think about it that way. As revenues go up, retained earnings go up. More revenues means more profit, means higher retained earnings. More expenses 
means lower retained earnings because lower profit, okay? So this is the impact on retained earnings. I want to make sure that's clear, okay? If either one of these goes up, so if expenses go up, the impact is that retained earnings goes down. If revenues go up, the impact is that retained earnings goes up because earnings will be bigger if revenues go up. Earnings will be smaller if revenues, uh, earnings will be smaller if expenses go up. Bigger expenses means less profit. Bigger revenues means more profit. And that should start to fill in, remember this little teaching aid I have for you, this little memory aid. Assets, liabilities, owners, equity, revenues, expenses. Okay, here's the debit and credit rules. You might wonder, why is it that revenues and expenses are opposite? Well, look at it here. Let's just look at what makes, what makes an asset or any of these accounts increase. To make an asset increase, you would make a debit entry to it. To make a liability increase, credit entry, just like we see right here. Owner's equity. If you want owner's equity to increase, you make a credit entry to it. So would stand to reason, if you want common stock to increase, credit it. If you want retained earnings to go up, make a credit entry to that account. Now we get to these revenues and expenses. Everything so far is lined up with what I told you. Assets up with a debit, right? Liabilities up with a credit. Owner's equity up with a credit. Here and here, owner's equity go up with a credit. Since revenues cause owner's equity to get bigger, because revenues make retained earnings bigger, they will increase with a credit, just like this. Expenses have the opposite effect. Since expenses, if they go up, that's going to reduce owner's equity, just like we saw right here. So when expenses increase, we debit them. And a debit to expenses ultimately has the impact of making your owner's equity smaller. So think about it this way. Revenues go up with a credit because eventually what's going to happen, and this is a different discussion for a little bit later, eventually we're going to close out this revenue account. We're going to clear it out. And when we do that, it's going to make retained earnings bigger. Expenses go up with a debit. And eventually when we want to measure, for example, the month of March, we're going to clear out our expense accounts too. And when we do that, that's going to cause not revenue, it's going to cause owner's equity right here to go down, okay? Forget what I did right there. When you clear out this expense account, ultimately it's going to make your retained earnings smaller. This is just a preview of coming attractions. One of the topics we're going to cover in a subsequent video is something called closing entries. Think about it this way. What we have over here with this trial balance, we've got revenue accounts right here and we have expense accounts. And they all have values. We saw that in the income statement. Remember the $3,100 profit? Well, guess what? Those are the revenues and expenses for the month of February. How are we ever going to start to measure March if we don't have a clean slate? So what we need to do is we need to wipe those accounts clean. There, this is a process called closing the temporary accounts. Your income statement accounts are your temporary accounts. There's also one called dividends, but we'll talk about that at a later date. Think about it this way. Think about going to a football game. And at the end of the football game, let's say the score is the Grand Valley State Lakers, 48, the Ferris State Bulldogs. They had a field goal with three points. Uh, so we clearly, we are the victors, but then we have to clear the scoreboard. It's got to be 0-0 for the next home game because we have to start from 0-0 until we defeat our next opponent, right? Same kind of thing here. We got a zero off the scoreboard. These revenues need to become zero. These expenses need to become zero. Look what's going to happen once we do this. Notice we have beverage sales here, rep food sales and the expenses. Big blank space over here. That's because the process of clearing out these revenue and expense temporary accounts basically zeroes them out but it brings our retained earnings balance from zero all the way up to $3,100 over here. The net effect of these revenues and these expenses was a profit of $3,100 for the month of February. We're gonna zero those accounts. 
dump that profit into retained earnings with a credit entry, the trial balance still balances. Nothing changed with the assets and liabilities and owner's equity with the exception of retained earnings. And now you start to maybe see this concept of retained earnings in action. We earned some profit, $3,100. Once the month is complete, zero out the scoreboard, dump that profit or the score from our month of February, dump it into retained earnings. And that $3,100 is the earnings of the company for the period since it was uh, formed. They have not been distributed. In other words, this $3,100 of profit has been retained by the company. Retained earnings is not cash. Cash in this case was almost $17,000 at the end of the month. Retained earnings is the net effect of our operations and the cumulative profits that we've generated minus any dividends that we may have distributed to owners, but we haven't paid any dividends yet. We've retained all the earnings and you see it right here.